Today is December 3rd, 2013. I'm Cindy Kelly, president of the Atomic Heritage Foundation. And with me, I have Lester Tenney. Um, I'm going to start by asking Lester to say your name and spell it, please. Lester Tenney, L-E-S-T-E-R, Tenney, T-E-N-N-E-Y. Maybe you could start by telling us where you were born and um, what your childhood was like. I was born in uh, Chicago, Illinois on July 1, 1920. I spent most of my young career uh, in, in and around Chicago. Uh, joined the uh, 192nd Tank Battalion National Guard on November 25th, uh, actually September 25th of 1940. Wanted to get my years over with for the, uh, the fact that they started the a moment uh, well, inscription or volunteer service. And so I wanted to get my year over with, so I joined the National Guard, knowing that it was going to be mobilized in November of 1940. So I knew that at the time. I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do, but I wanted to finish my one year. So what happened? I finished my... <laughs> I finished my one year as I landed in Manila. One year later, uh, I ended up in Manila on November 25th of 1941. And of course, as you know, the war started just a, a week or so after that. And that's where I ended up serving, was in the Philippines. So tell us about what was your job, what, what does your company do? I was a radio operator and then I became a tank commander. And with the, in, this was all during the time of the fighting uh, on Bataan and in the Philippines. We, uh, we were in the first tank battle. In fact, the first tank battle of World War II was in the Philippines. And it was on December 23rd of 1941 when uh, our tanks met the Japanese up at Lingayan. So, unfortunately, no one knows about that, but that was the first tank battle that the United States was in, in World War II. They had uh, artillery, they had flamethrowers, they had everything aimed at us. Uh, we uh, went in with five tanks, and within a matter of five minutes, we lost our first tank, uh, Lieutenant Ben Morin, was a tank commander of the first tank, and the first tank was hit with a shell in the, uh, the track. And once the track is hit, you can do nothing. Uh, the, second, the second tank, uh, a shell went through the bow gunner's seat and took the bow gunner's head off, went right straight through the tank. And the third tank was destroyed pretty well. So we had five tanks, three of them were hit and then we ended up making a, a, a reverse uh, to get out of there. Uh, you know, in the Philippines, the tanks didn't have a wide area to, to maneuver. We were on a road, one road with one tank behind the other. And if you stop and think of it, the only tank that could fire at the enemy was the lead tank. The second tank, if he would fire at the enemy, he was going to hit the lead tank. So, Tanks in the Philippines was not a very wise move, but we were there anyhow. And right after that, we started the strategic withdrawal down into Bataan, which was a part of the Orange Plan that was designed in 1935-36, that if Japan should attack the Philippines, it was agreed to that we would have what is known as uh, uh, the Bataan Peninsula, is where we would all congregate and wait for supplies from Pearl Harbor, and that was back in 1935 and 36. Little did they know that there would be no Pearl Harbor available for us. So that's what really happened. So the um, battle was engaged, you say, before, just before Pearl Harbor, or what, when was the battle? The first, the first tank battle was on December 23rd, 1941. 
up at Agu, A-G-O-O, up in Langayan Gulf. And then at what point did, did you successfully uh, reach Bataan? Uh, we started down from, from Agu, we started down around December 25th, down into the m m peninsula known as Bataan. And it was a piggyback operation. The uh, infantry would leave first, then the artillery would leave, and the tanks would stay there at the front lines to hold the enemy off until our forces were about uh, 15 kilometers down, and then they would set up. Once the forces would set up, then the tanks would leave. So it was piggyback, the infantry, the artillery, and then the tanks. So the tanks were always up in the front line protecting the, the other troops until we landed back into the peninsula of known as Bataan. So tell us what happened there. Uh, there we spent the next uh, four and a half months fighting the Japanese on a day-to-day -day basis, night to night. The Japanese would try to come down from these front lines. They established a front line at the Pilar Bagak Road. Well, the turning point came sometime in the first part of April when the Japanese decided that they could, they didn't get Bataan to surrender and it was a thorn in their side. Uh, they couldn't accept the fact that they were still fighting when they expected to win in 45 days. Um, and so uh, the, the battle, what they did was they had a whole flotilla of Japanese forces with uh, the Mata on their way to Australia. And they turned them around and brought them back to the Philippines to capture Bataan. And uh, on the 3rd of April was when the, the battle really started all over again. But at that time, it was a very serious battle. There was no time during the morning, noon, or night that there was not gunshot. The Japanese kept coming down. They would step over their dead. They would, uh, our machine guns got so hot that the barrel would just curve like that. The barrel could not set. So once the machine gun's barrel started to turn, we would leave. Uh, it, was a, it was a horrible situation uh, until April 9th, uh, April 8th, uh, General MacArthur sent word down to our General King and uh, gave, sent a message from his post in Australia and the message was, uh, this, uh, this garrison will not surrender. If all else fails, you'll charge the enemy. MacArthur wanted the men to die fighting. He did not want them to surrender. General King felt that if he did not surrender the forces then, Bataan would be known throughout the world as the slaughtering point of World War II. And so General King, in spite of the order from General MacArthur, and knowing that he could be court-martialed, General King ended up surrendering all the forces on Bataan. And that was 12,000 Americans and 58,000 Filipinos. 70,000 troops were surrendered that morning, April 9th of 1942. And no one knows anything about Bataan. Well, we know a lot about Pearl Harbor and other things, but nobody knows about Bataan, and unfortunately. And then deaths. the baton, then the, the march started to take us to prison camp. It became known as the Bataan Death March. Uh, it was called the Bataan Death March, uh, not because of how many died, although out of the 12,000 Americans, only about 1,700 lived to come home at the end of the war. But the reason it was called the Death March was because of the way they killed you. If you stopped walking, you died. If you had a defecate, you died. If you had a malaria attack, you died. It made no difference to what it was. Either they cut your head off, they shot you, or they bayoneted you. But you died if you fell down. And so that was why it was called a Baton Death March. Because the bodies were strewn along the side of the road. A uh, man would die, they'd kick the body on the side of the road or put him on the road and, and let, a, let a Japanese truck roll over them. It was barbaric, slaughter. It was just nothing else to say. 
And that's what happened on Bataan until we got to our first prison camp. We had no food or water. The temperature was about 106, 108 degrees. Uh, we were all sick. We all had malaria, dysentery. We had uh, gunshot wounds, bayonet wounds. We were in no position to walk, and yet we had to do that. Uh, it was, we were on half, we were on one-third rations for the last, from July 13th. We were on one-third rations. We were eating iguanas, monkeys, and snakes. That was our diet. So we were in no position to really make a march. And that's what happened to us. So how many made it through? Well, we never know. The true number has never been calculated because we don't know how many died along the side of the road where the Japanese just never, never bothered burying the body at all. Um, so we only know the, the number that were captured on Bataan, that around 12,000, maybe 11,800 and something. The number that actually came home that we could, we could pretty well attest to was about uh, 12, uh, 1,200, maybe 1,500 men total. So we lost during that three and a half years, from the time of the surrender to the time of the uh, end of the war, in that three and a half years, uh, of that 12,000 men, I would say we lost 10,500 of them. Yeah. And would that be true of the 58,000? Um, no, not, uh, it, although it was very bad for the Filipinos. Uh, the Japanese treated them real bad. But they were allowed to go back to their burials, to their little homes, to their villages. And so, in spite of the fact that many of them started the march, many of them were able to leave the march and blend in with the rest of the civilians uh, and or just go back home, where the Japanese did allow the Filipinos to go back home. So they never did have the total problem that the Americans had. Uh, we were Caucasians to the, to the race of the yellow race, and we were just no good. Uh, the Japanese had a philosophy. Uh, they lived in the Bushida Code of Conduct. And the Bushida Code of Conduct was one that said, you shall not surrender if you surrender, you're a coward. And so if, if you surrender, you're a coward. If you surrender, you're lower than a dog. No one would do that. And so we, the, 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 the Americans who surrendered, were treated as if they were a dog all that time because that was their philosophy. And uh, that's what we had to live with all those years. Never changed. Of course, that has, um, that's at odds with the Geneva Agreement. Well, when we, um, those who lived to get to that first prison camp, what happened there was, again, the men were dying at 200, 250 a day from the effects of the march, from dysentery. We had no water, so you would see water on the side of the road in uh, caribou wallows. The caribou would sit in there and bathe. And um, we would see that and spread the scum along the side and just drink the water. And the result was dysentery, real bad dysentery. So when we arrived at that first prison camp, uh, so many of the men that were alive, they died within the next 30 days just from the dysentery that they had contacted. So it was just plain slaughter all along the way. Um, if you lived through the prison camp, the first prison camp, then they took, in my particular case, they took 500 of us and put us in the hold of a ship and gave us one and a half a cup of water a day and one half a ration of rice a day, a ball of rice. And we went on our way to Japan. It took 32 days and we were in the hold of a ship. And the, the, the men who died in the, in the on the ship, the survivors would sort of have a hold a ration, uh, hold a, a um, uh, auction for the ration of the rice of the water of the do dead men. So it was, it, it was a, it's not the kind of thing you want to even think about, but it was there. And so we lived on the ship going to Japan. We ended up in Japan and uh, our particular ship with 500 men uh, got there all right, but in the total picture, 
there were 26 ships that American POWs, Americans that were captured on Bataan, Corregidor, um, uh, and other islands in the Philippines, and the 26 ships that went, 26 ships went down in the water with the prisoners in it because the Japanese refused to put POW markings or Red Cross markings on the ships. And so the Americans bombed the ships, torpedoes and bombs and, and uh, submarines. And 26 ships went down, we lost about 10,000 men just in the water. So yeah, we're talking about a, we're talking about a uh, horrific uh, situation that we had to live through. Now once we lived and got to Japan, in our group, my 500 men and myself, we ended up being uh, sold to Mitsui coal mine. And Mitsui bought us from the Japanese military at so much ahead, and we ended up shoveling coal. I shoveled coal in a Japanese coal mine uh, 12 hours a day, every day, for three years. And the only way you got out of work is if you got hurt. And sometimes you had to get hurt by doing it yourself. So we broke our own bones, we broke our own hands, legs, arms, foot, whatever we could break to see if we could get a couple of days out of work in the mine. And that's how we lived for the next uh, three and a half, three years. Until uh, the we didn't know anything about that first atomic bomb that uh, was in uh, Hiroshima. We knew something was up because of the Japanese in the coal mine told us that there was a big bomb and big explosion, a lot of people were killed. But we knew nothing about it until the uh, 9th of uh, August, I believe it was, of 1945, when uh, uh, we heard an explosion and we saw a tremendous cloud rise. We were in, uh, in, in our prison camp in Omata, which was right across the bay from Nagasaki. So it was the bomb at Nagasaki that we heard, and uh, the theory is, I guess we were witnesses to it, because uh, we were right there. And we didn't know what it was, I said, but uh, the war ended uh, one week later. Is it an amazing story? Um, and I know you've, you've spelled it out in this marvelous book. Tried to. You did. Uh, my hitch in hell. Um, what what happened? We'll just continue chronologically. What happened then? Once you heard uh, a week afterwards, and the Japanese surrender, were you free at that point? Or? Yes, we uh, we always knew that there would be, we knew that we would be free, uh, and the war ended if if four things ever happened, and we knew this for years. Number one, if we didn't have to go to work. Number two, if we ever got all the rice we wanted to eat. Number three, if we ever got a Red Cross box, which Red Cross sent there, but we never got them. And number four, if we didn't have to bow to the Japanese every time we saw them. And on August 15th, we went to work in the coal mine, and about an hour later we came home. And everybody was talking, what the hell happened? It's the first time in three years, no work. And then at 10 o'clock in the morning, they put us in the, in the big mess hall, and they gave every man a Red Cross box. And this Red Cross box is a box that the Red Cross provided for prisoners. And in that box were sardines, a salmon, a cigarettes, a Hershey bar, uh, different things of that nature, just as a Red Cross box. So each man got a Red Cross box, the first time in three and a half years. Man, something was happening, we just didn't know what, but it was very exciting. Then at noon we went in for our lunch meal. So for the, oh, three years we were in Japan. Our meals consisted of a bowl of rice three times a day. That was it. A bowl of rice three times a day. Occasionally you would get something different. Maybe occasionally you'd get some vegetables, but by the time you got the vegetables it was nothing. But basically it was three bowls of rice. And so we came into the mess hall on that particular day at noon, and as we went through the line to get a, a, a bento box of rice, the cook behind the qualies would say to us, you want more rice, fella? And we would say, what? Yeah, put that, pack it on. 
man, they would pack the rice on and we'd sit down. We knew something was happening. We just didn't know what. Until about, uh, I guess it was about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, I spoke enough Japanese that my friends asked me to go out and say hello to the Japanese without bowing. See what happened. Now, if you don't understand, if you don't, if you do what they say, it's okay. If you don't bow, they they beat the hell out of you. I went out and in, in Japanese I said "Konnichiwa, Tomodachi," and I didn't bow. And about two seconds later, he bowed to me, and I knew the war was over. No question. And about 5.30, 6 o'clock that night, they put us in the whole 1,700 men by that time. Australians, New Zealanders, Englishmen, Dutchmen, Javanese, Javanese, not Japanese. And uh, so our camp had 1,700 men. We were all in the, in the parade area where we had to go every morning, every night for roll call. And when we got there and the Japanese came over, came in with all their trucks, on every truck was a machine gun, and the Japanese commander tapped on his truck and he said to, very loud to all of us, Japan and America are now friends. And they drove off. <coughs> so in answer to your question, we were just standing there. We had no idea what was going on. The Japanese drove off, they didn't kill any of us, and uh, that was it, period. That was the end of the war for us. So what did you do? Some of the men went into town looking for some of the guards, looking for some of the Japanese in the coal mine. We were beaten quite severely by the Japanese civilians in the coal mine, as well as the guards. I mean, it would be nothing to be beaten with a pickaxe or a hammer or a shovel. And you know, when they swing a shovel at your face and they break, your, break the bones, it's pretty hard, it hurts. And so we went, some of the men went out looking for them to kill them. That's really what they wanted. But uh, it was really amazing. The group that I went with, we started to look for some of the Japanese, but then we found some other Japanese women uh, just bowing to us and being very polite, uh, inviting us into their house for tea and a little snack, whatever they had. And they were so friendly. And so in a matter of, I would say in a matter of one hour, we were no longer looking for the Japanese. We were just happy to be alive. I guess that's pretty good. We were so happy to be alive and so shocked to be alive. So that's what we did. That's my story. I don't understand how you survived. How, how did you survive all of this, mentally as well as physically? Well, I think I survived the Bataan March by establishing goals. When the march started, the, it was awful. The beatings, the hollering, and the men being killed immediately was awful. And so I said to myself, if I'm going to get out of this, I'm going to have to set a goal. And I saw a herd of caribou in the distance, and I just said, I have to get to that herd of caribou. That's it. That's my goal. I don't care how long it takes me, a day, a week, a month, two hours, whatever it is. I have to get there. And whatever I did, I did with the philosophy that I had to get to that herd of caribou. So the Japanese hollered at me, told me to do something, I did whatever they said, whatever they did. Because I knew that if I fell down, I'm dead. I had to stand up. And so that was my goal. And I established goals. And when I got to the herd of caribou, I would see something else in the distance and I would establish a goal for that. And I just kept doing that. A goal, a goal, a goal. <coughs> And luckily, I was able to deal with it. I had my problems, but same as everybody else. I had a very severe attack of malaria and dysentery that I thought I was dead, but somehow or other I pulled through. And so that's what we did. What about your comrades? How did they survive? Did they have goals well, too, or what did they do? That's a sad situation because so many of my comrades died. And at the very beginning, in that first 30 days, in that first prison camp, in, on the march, some of my buddies who were wonderful people, they just said, I can't go on, and I can't go on any further. Or I don't want to go on any further. Or I'm not going to continue this. I just, let me die and get out of here. And so many of them prayed to die. And 
we prayed to live and prayed to die. And some died and some lived. And there's no way of knowing why one or the other. We all had the same thing. We all lived the same. We ate the same. We worked the same. We did the same. The only thing that was different was our philosophy of life. It's the only thing that was different. But those who wanted to die, died. There's no, you couldn't stop them. That's my buddy. So have you, you've been in touch with some of your uh, survivors? Right now there's very few left alive. I don't think that the, from the Baton Death March, I don't think there's 10 men left alive today. The Joe Alexander, he calls me from Texas. He says, how's it going? And I said, well, what about you? He said, oh, I got problems. I can't see and I can't walk and I can't hear. I said, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's true for all of us, you know. And that's my problem. I don't hear too well. I don't see too well. And I don't walk too well. But the hell with everything else. I'm still here. It's marvelous. So tell us about uh, what your project has been over these last, I guess, 60 years, 70 almost, uh, to try to bring some reconciliation to this process. Uh, yes, well, to, to just drift, drift from 1945 uh, to 1995, that's a good drift. Because during that period of time, my goal was just to live. And I didn't care about being a POW. Nobody knew about it. I never talked about it. It was not important. Just get my life back in order. In 1995, I wrote the book, I you can help. But amazing, the next thing that happened was that in 1995, the Japanese issued a, a prepared a bill and funded it with uh, 160 million dollars. And they invited all POWs and their families to come to Japan for peace and friendship. All POWs except Americans. In 1995, they passed the bill, they funded the bill, they had the money, all POWs except Americans. In 1995, I started to ask questions, why? I asked my own government, I asked senators, congressmen, I asked the president, I asked ambassadors, why, how can this be? And I got zero answers, zero. Nobody cared. Then in 2009, I had written letters to the ambassador Fujisaki, who was the American, the Japanese ambassador to the United States. Ambassador Fujisaki contacted me. He said, come to the embassy. I'd like to talk with you. I said, I can't. I'm busy. I said, I'm here at the, at the cemetery laying a wreath to the unknown soldier. He said, well, how about coming tomorrow? I said, I'm leaving tomorrow for San Diego. And the ambassador said, well, would you and your wife come to my residence? I said, yes. So Betty and I left the cemetery and went to Ambassador Fujisaka's residence, which is a magnificent place, just beautiful. And when we got there, Ambassador Fujisaki said to me, what is it you POWs want? What are you so upset about? And I said, there was three things we wanted. Number one, we wanted an apology from the Japanese for doing what they did to unarmed POWs. Disgraceful. The killings, the slaughter. Number two, we wanted to be treated equally. Why they invited all POWs except Americans. We wanted to go back to Japan at their expense and go back to the, to the prison camp we were in to show our family this is where we were. Number three, we won an apology from the Japanese companies who used and abused us. In my case, Mitsui. Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Nippon, Nippon, Shida, Kawasaki. 86 different companies used Americans. And so he said, well, we will work on it. And we spent a few hours there, very kind, he and his wife. That was November 11th of, 19, of 2009. In February of 2010, which was three months later, the State Department called me and the Japanese Embassy had asked the State Department to get me to prepare a list of POWs to go to Japan. 
and uh, would I would I arrange would I take care of it? Would I do would I lead the pro the program? And uh, they they budgeted six one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, and so they figured that they had enough money for fourteen people to go, and it was first class airfare, first class everything, and so I put together a group of seven uh, seven POWs and next to kin or family, whoever wanted to go. And we did go. And uh, the first thing we did when we got there, the first day, we were greeted by Ambassador Roos, the U.S. Ambassador to Japan. The next day we were at the Japanese Diet, where the Minister of Foreign Affairs, in front of all the cameras and all the television, stood there, stood up while we sat down, where he offered us an apology for the inhumane treatment that the Japanese soldiers dealt out to us. And so we got the apology, we got the trip there. The only thing we have not gotten, either as of right now, the Japanese companies say that they're not the same company they were at one time, so they don't want any part of it. I think they're afraid of, of being sued, and uh, and that's it. But I sued. I brought a lawsuit against the Japanese company, Mitsui. My lawsuit was filed in 1999 against Mitsui. And the, the Japanese only had one witness, one witness, and that was the United States State Department, was the witness for the Japanese against the Americans. At that time, they were against the Americans. They said that the treaty solved all issues Therefore, we had no cause of action. And this went on for four years. We had a group of lawyers from some of the largest and most prestigious law firms in America that did this all free of charge because they felt that, that we were entitled to get this apology. And we never asked for any money. That was never the issue at all. And to make a long story short, we still have not received that. And that's the next thing on my agenda is to see how I can get an apology from them for allowing their employees to beat us and they did nothing about it. And except for that, my, we, we've enjoyed uh, Japanese friends. During this process, well, I made, my wife and I made some tremendous friends, Japanese friends, who invited us back to Japan to lecture to college students. I had one professor, a Japanese lady, Yuka, who invited us back there for two months, the two weeks rather, all expenses paid. And I said to Yuka, I said, who's going to pay for this? Where are you getting the money? And she said, my mother died and left me an inheritance. And I choose to use that inheritance to let the students know what happened in, but on, in the war. And would you come and lecture to them? Which I did. But I made so many wonderful Japanese friends. And during this period of time, I realized that I had to forgive or I couldn't do this. I couldn't go there and talk with them if I hadn't learned to forgive and get on with my life. And so the forgiveness that I did was not for them. The forgiveness was for me. By my forgiving, I opened up my door. I've often said that my friends who still hate, they're still prisoners. They're still prisoners. They have not been released yet. So I did this and it's been a wonderful thing. Thousands of people have met, as friends. Uh, we've gotten so much from the Japanese. Uh, the Americans, the, the State Department has worked so hard. The Japanese Embassy has worked with, very hard with us. And so they're, we're all doing the best we can under the circumstances. I think that what happened last night where the Japanese honored me. And what they honored me for was so wonderful in my philosophy, my thinking. They honored me for improving the relationship between Americans and Japanese. That I, you know the philosophy, sometimes it takes one person who can do a lot. Well, here it is, I'm one person. And here they were, the Japanese community, uh, saying to me, I've helped create a relationship, and that was very great honor for me. Well, it sounds like it was well deserved. That I, that I won't argue about. I just, 
tell, I just tell the story the way it is. Anything else? Is there anything else that you see as next steps other than the company's uh, apology that, that ought to happen to improve our relationships? I, I like to say at the end of a, of a talk, what is this old soldier doing now? I'm 93 years old, I'm my way to 94, and we started about six years ago because I never received a care package. I never received anything from, from home. I made the decision that the kids fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan were going to get a care package. And so we formed a company called Care Packages from Home. And I got some of my friends at the retirement area where we live to uh, uh, donate money and donate time. And slowly we developed this company. It's a 501c3 organization. We send care packages. Up to this point, we've already sent almost 17,000 care packages. And every care package accommodates between 8 and 12 soldiers. So we have actually helped in some way about 160,000 of our troops overseas. They get care packages from us. They get letters from us. They get information saying, we, we are proud of what you're doing and we're behind you. And the letters we get back are just wonderful because these kids just are so thrilled to know that there are total strangers, total strangers, sending them gift boxes. And so it's a wonderful thing. And we've been doing it, and maybe with the, with the luck of God and a little prayer here and there, maybe we'll continue for a while. That's marvelous. It, it, it's very difficult. Uh, I got married uh, before I was in the, when, in the service in... Uh, uh, I think it was about uh, September of 1941, before we went overseas, to a girl that I'd been dating for a long time, Clara. And uh, when I came home, uh, she had been told I was missing in action, presumed dead. And she waited three years, and when I didn't come back, she remarried. So when I came home, I came home to this woman that I was in love with, that I wanted to leave my life with to find that she'd been married to another man. And so that was a tremendous traumatic experience. And I developed post-traumatic stress very seriously. Um, I felt I did anyhow. And uh, so I had a lot of stress to deal with. And I think that the end result was at the end of about 30 or 60 days, I just looked at myself in the mirror and I said, I have to get on my life. My life is just more important, but I just went through is not important anymore. Now it's from this point on. And so that's what I did. It was from this point on that was important, nothing else. And I think that's really what, it, what, what had happened. And I told no one about my being a POW for years. I, I mean, I'm talking about for lots and lots of years, except my family. I remarried, and they knew that I was a prisoner of war, but I don't think they really understood what being the prisoner of war was. I don't think that they ever really delved into my life and what it was. Watching men get killed, having men die, having men hope to die and dying, and you live. It's, it's traumatic. It's, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, and you get to the point when you see this happening, you don't really make good, you don't want to make good friends because you don't want to lose them. And so that's what really what happens. I had a few very close friends, but they've since died. Lou Britton died. Bob Martin died. These are close friends of mine. And but nobody, but nobody, nobody really understands what a person went through. And even today, no one really understands what a person that survived this kind of traumatic experience has put his life through. And I'm talking about on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, having to aim a gun and shoot somebody is a, is a traumatic experience. And sometimes it's just a mental problem of what you have to do that's a tremendous experience. And so when you kill somebody, when you see somebody killed, when you see the blood splat around, it, it's traumatic. Some people deal with it differently than others. And I'm one of the ones that dealt with it the best way I could. And I think I've dealt with it pretty good. 
So you basically pulled yourself up with your own bootstraps. I mean, there was no psychological counseling available, or was there? No. We had nothing. The United States had nothing. They, no, they didn't even know what post-traumatic stress was. I'm currently writing a book. I've got most probably, with a little luck, maybe two or three more months to finish it. It's on post-traumatic stress. And if the book ends with the importance of forgiving as one of the ways of dealing with post-traumatic stress. And I have a whole chapter on forgiving. What's the importance of forgiving and why we do it. And so maybe the book would come out before I, before I fade out. I don't know. We'll try. When you got home, back to the States, how did you feel as a returning vet, as a how did the surrender affect the way you felt when you came back home to the throngs of waiting Americans? Well, uh, when our ship landed in, our ship came back and landed in Seattle. And it was a, a traumatic experience because after all these years we were landing in the United States and the ship landed and there wasn't anyone there to say welcome home. No, no officer, no parade, no nothing. They dock the ship and get off and go here and go to sleep and tomorrow morning they, I mean it was a real, a real downer. After three and a half years of being a prisoner of war we came home and no, no one, no one knew, no one cared, no one, it was a, it was a downer for every one of us. And maybe that downer is what stayed with us all those, those years. Having, having the feeling that nobody gives a damn is a very strong feeling. And when nobody gives a darn, you, 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 you sort of start flying around, you don't know what you're doing right. And I think that that had a big, big impact on me, uh, having no one uh, really uh, to say hello, welcome home soldier, no one. You see it in the movies, they came back from Vietnam, they came back from Viet Korea, they came back from the, being a prisoner, they get off the plane, and there's Navy officers shaking their hands, and everybody's welcoming them home. And we sit there and we look at them and we say, eh, never happened to us. So that's it. And so you deal with it, you deal with it, you just get on with your life and you just do the best you can. Thank you, Pat. Was that because you were POWs? Uh, were there, there committees waiting or, or crowds waiting for the, the enlisted soldier returning? Do you know? There was no one, no one at the dock when our ship landed. No one. When they finally told me that I was going to go to the Ship General Hospital, that's where I was stay, that's where I was going to go. We stayed overnight in Seattle at a camp, at a military camp, and the following morning they took us by bus, by truck, to the railroad station, like a herd of cattle. We got on the got to the railroad station. They handed each man their own papers. Mine was for Fort for uh, camp for uh, yeah a hospital in uh, yeah anyhow. Mine was for a hospital. Everybody had a different hospital. And we were, we didn't know where. We took the train and I got at, got off at the train. Uh, I, I guess it was a day later. Uh, and they came and picked me up and took me to Ship General Hospital. When I got to the hospital, my mother and father and my brother was there at the hospital. But they weren't there when, I, when that ship landed. They weren't there any time during that. I got to the hospital my family was there. That was it. And I assume for all those three and a half years you had no communication? No. None. With your family. None of any consequence. 